Okay, so let me bring you up to speed because we're going to kind of bounce around in the chapter of Ezra chapter 8, okay? Um, Because we're not going to read the first part. That's the genealogy of the folks that are going with Ezra. And you may be sitting there and asking, where are they going? That's a great question, right? Because we didn't make much of this last week, but I want to make much of it today and kind of bring you up to speed with what's happening here in the story of Ezra. Okay, so Ezra is going on a journey to teach the people the law of the Lord, Okay, to teach the people the law of the Lord. And he's taking some things with him, right? Some gold, some silver, a lot of moolah, which is money, right? Loads of wealth, several million dollars of gold and silver is what's estimated to be a part of this journey. Now, when I read about this journey, when I've studied this journey, it reminds me a lot, if you've ever looked at the book of Acts or studied the book of Acts, about Paul's missionary journeys, where Paul went around to these different churches, Galatia, Ephesus, um, Colossae, right? All of these different churches. He planted most of the churches, and then he goes on three missionary journeys in the book of Acts, towards the end of the book of Acts, to visit them, to check on their health, to do leadership training, to, you know, all of these different things, um, to basically check on the churches that he planted. Now, it's not the same, but it's similar to what Ezra's doing here, okay? Ezra is going around to proclaim the truth of God and to teach the law of the Lord um, to people. And so he's going on a journey and he's taking some things with him uh, for wealth. And so as part of that, as part of that, because I mean, how many of you know when you go on a journey, you got to have some resources, right? And in this time, traveling was very dangerous because people knew if you were traveling, chances are you had money. And so it was very common for them to encounter people along the way that would want to rob them, okay, that would want to rob them. And so Ezra, to go on this journey, needed warriors, right? He needed warriors, okay? He needed the Mike Tiltons and the Jeannie Tiltons, the warriors, to go with him to guard, not only are you going to be here on Christmas, but you're flexing <laughs> on October 23rd. It's a good Sunday for Mike Tilton. All right, um, so, uh, so, so they, he needed warriors because the reality of the problem for Ezra and the conflict that we're encountering here in chapter 8 is this. It's a long walk to get where he's going, a four-month's journey. Okay? And we've already talked about the loads of wealth that he's carrying with him, the millions, do- millions of dollars worth of gold and silver that he's taking with him, and then the lack of warriors, because everybody that's around is spent and taxed from building the temple. Everyone is spent and taxed from them, uh, from, from them spending so much uh, so much time in exile and slavery, 70 plus years, then coming back and spending 20 plus years building, rebuilding the temple. And, and, and so we're talking 90 years of uncertainty, 90 years of taxing. And now Ezra's like, hey, we've got to branch out. We've got to go teach people the law of the Lord. And I, I need some help. And, and they're spent. There's a lack of warriors. And so he's got defeated people. He's got common folk that aren't how do we say, warriors, okay? And, and he's supposed to go on this four months journey to teach people about God. He knows that God has called him. And the result, uh, if the problem's not defeated, that Ezra has talked about and that he's building up here and that we're going to see in verse 22 is this. Death, you want to go on a journey with me? Death is at risk, Okay? Uh, or dishonor, which was huge. If you look at verse 22, for I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all for those uh, against all who, forsa- who forsake him. Right. And so what Ezra is saying here is he was ashamed to ask. Because he knew that death was at stake here, life was at stake, okay, and dishonor. Because he didn't want to make a fool out of God. 
Because he had gone and sold to the king that the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him and the power of his wrath is against. And so his faith is in God. But those are the, those are the results if he fails here. And so that's the reality of where we are in the book of Ezra. Is that Ezra is about to go on a journey and he needs to build a team. And he needs to build a team of warriors that can go with him that will have his back and that will support him, that will hold his arms up, and that will protect um, the honor that is God's, right? The honor that is God's. The honor that is God's. Um, I love the picture, right? Because here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I'm sure, I'm sure a couple of you are like me, right? I love the picture in my mind of Rocky. Anybody seen the Rocky movies? All right, best one. Somebody just shout out the best Rocky movie. Four, Rocky Four. Is that the one where he goes? Yeah, that's a good one. I love that in every Rocky movie, there's that two to three minute just, just fighting montage with the cool song. And, and when you're listening to it and you're watching Rocky, it feels like you could run through a brick wall. And then you try to run through the brick wall and it doesn't work. No, I'm just kidding. Um, right, but because here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. As I watch Rocky, I can fight my battles, Right? Like, I can, I can battle the things that God has put in front of me to battle, right? Anybody else feel the same way? Like, I can, I can do that. I can do that. See, because, because a lot of people today that we do life with and that we, belt, we rub elbows with, right, they, I, I question some people's ability to step into the ring and fight their own battles. Anybody else? Right? Okay. Like, I I. I I question that because every uh, some some not everybody some of the people right that I'm that I'm uh, that, that I'm around right that they 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 would just rather not nah, I'm a lover not a fighter. Well, let, the problem with that is is this when we come into a spiritual context, kind of coming out of Rocky. Okay, we're just using that as an illustration. Okay, um, Rocky is not biblical. Okay, he's not even real. Okay, there was somebody that I was watching Rocky with, and they were like, I can't believe this is based on a true story. <laughs> it's not. What? Okay, anyway, right? Because here's the, here's the thing, okay? And we talked about this last week. The enemy comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That's nice, isn't it? And so listen to me, Christian. There is a battle for your heart going on. There's a battle for your attention. There's a battle for your focus. There's a battle for your discipline. There's a battle for you going on. And you're called to fight. We're called to fight. We're called to fight. Okay? And so the reality is, right, I'm great with fighting. Here's what I want to know. Here's what I want to know. I can go in the ring. I will, I will tie the gloves on. I was driving 495 in Massachusetts yesterday. I was ready. Right? I was ready. I was ready. Okay? Right? I can fight my battles. I want to know that somebody's got the spit bucket. I want to know that somebody's got that little medical thing to put under your eye when you get, when you get knocked in the eye. I want to know that when the round is over and the bell rings that there's somebody put a stool under me. That there's people in the corner. And that's what Ezra was sent to go build. He had to recruit warriors. We mentioned it last Sunday, Exodus 18. Jethro telling Moses that he had to do the same thing here. We see it throughout the Old Testament that before people who were called by God could go and do what God had called them to do, they had to recruit, build, and train a team. To be behind them, to be with them, and to go with them. So let's look at verse 15, okay? Look at verse 15 in chapter 8. You good, Ken? Yep, okay, good. He's back there. All right. Verse 15, Ken. I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found they're none of the sons of, of Levi. Then I sent Eleazar, 
uh, Ariel, um, you, you remember her, uh, the little, anyway, um, okay, <laughs> Shemaiah, El Nathan, Jareeb, uh, there's another El, El, uh, El Nathan, uh, right, right, yeah, Nathan, Zechariah, uh, Meshulam, leading men, and for jo- uh, Joy Rib, jo- 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 I- anyway, and, the, and El Nathan again, there's three of them, who were men of insight, and sent them Edo, the leading men, at the place of Casiphia, sorry, telling them what to say to Edo and his brothers and the temple servants at the place of Casiphia, namely to send us ministers for the house of our God. And by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion, the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with, the sons of his, with his sons and kinsmen, 18, okay, and Hashabiah, and with him Jeshiah, and the, I know, I feel the same way about all these names. <laughs> I feel the exact same way. Keep it going. I mean, just, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, and kinsmen and their sons, 20, besides 220 of the temple servants, whom David and his officials, now here's the point, here's the point, and this is why I wanted to read this, David and his officials had set apart to attend the Levites. These were all mentioned by name. These were all mentioned by name. There's power in a name. There's significance in a name. Now, I encourage you, if you want to email me, I can tell you some great uh, commentaries and some studies of Ezra to read. Every single name here is significant, is powerful, okay? We don't have time to unpack the honor and the reasons here that all of these names are mentioned, but I can tell you, and, va- and just trust me here, that it's significant. Then, verse 21, I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from Him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. And we've already read it this morning. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way. Since we had told the king the hand of our God is for good on all who seek Him. And the power of His wrath is against all who forsake Him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and He listened to our entreaty. See, we just spent a lot of time talking about building a team. Let me tell you this. We've said it before already uh, in talking about the book of Ezra a few weeks ago. God has given you everything that you need to accomplish the task in front of you, including the warriors behind you. I was walking through Martin's one day. I should have bought it when I saw it. I was, I was walking through Martin's one day. Now, this, this was probably 2011, 2012. Okay, so this, this was a long time ago when I was younger and dumber. I'm still young and dumb. I like to think so. Uh, the young part. Not, anyway, stop laughing at me, Andy. Um, that's my brother. Okay, I can tell him that. Um, but it was about 2012, and, uh, and, and I was walking through Martin's, and I was, I was frustrated. Because the church I was pastoring um, wasn't growing. And, and some of you know my story. I thought when I was called here in 2011 that uh, South Coast would be 500 people by six months. Well, it's funny. That's cute, isn't it? That's cute. Well, I did so well uh, as their pastor that the church isn't even alive anymore. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We merged. That's part of the story, okay? All right. But, uh, but, but I was just frustrated. I was frustrated. I was frustrated. So I, call, I called a friend of mine, um, and I was, wa- I was walking around just trying, to, just trying to, you know, distract my mind one day. I was walking around. I was talking uh, through Martin's, and sometimes you can go, they've got some comfortable furniture over there, so sometimes you can go and kind of sit and have a conversation on the phone on some of their nice furniture, and just pretend that it's yours, okay, and, uh, and so I'm sitting there having a conversation with, with, with my friend, and he said to me, he said, Travis, what I'm hearing is this, you need to stop loving the people that God hasn't blessed you with yet, 
instead of loving the people that are right in front of you. So I hung up on him, and we haven't talked since. <laughs> no, we talked about it for, for, for quite some time, actually. He said, one of the biggest mistakes that I made early on in ministry is I loved the people that God hadn't blessed me with yet more than I loved the people that he had blessed me with and that were faithful, that were right in front of me. And he said, use the people that God has given you now, even if they're not the people that you wouldn't have picked. Because if you just use the people that you would pick, then you're not using who God's placed around you, and you're saying that you're better at discerning what you need than God. God has placed the people around you that you need for such a time as this in this season. You don't have to go out and recruit and draft other people. Look around at the people that God has blessed you with right now and put in your path. And look at the role that they can play in your life right now. And you may need to, and I know this is uncomfortable, but you may need to go to them at times and have a conversation. Look, this is where I'm at, and I, would, I, need, I need somebody to do this. Would you pray about being this in my life? As Luis from Guatemala said here a couple weeks ago, and we're going to say it a couple of times today, we have not because we ask not. And some people are frustrating the life out of you. They're taking the life out of you because they're not fulfilling an expectation that you have in their life, get this, that you've never even communicated with them. It got quiet in here. You're not laughing anymore. We can't expect people to play roles in our life that we've never asked them to play. We can't expect people to fill voids in our life that they were never meant to fill. And so here, Ezra has the warriors. He says he was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way. So they fasted and implored God for this. And he listened to our entreaty. And so what did Ezra do? He asked for help. He asked for help. There was a problem. The stakes were high. Death and dishonor were on the line. And so what does Ezra do? He asked for help. He asked for help. God's provision in verse 18. And by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion, of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely, and his sons and his kinsmen. So the hand of God provided for Ezra. Brought him a support group. See, sometimes we're afraid to obey God because we're afraid that people will abandon us along the way. We're afraid, uh, ultimately, to go alone, to be in the rink, rink, ring, I'm not talking about ice skating. I guess, I, I guess that would fit, work well too, right? To be in there alone. But if we really have the hands of God with us, if it's really the call of God on our, on our lives, then God will send us people who will support us and who will join us to do the will of God. And so as we continue our journey in serving the Lord, the Lord will add more people who will join us until we become a fellowship for the glory of God. And along the way, he might take some people who will go and serve in other ways, in other places, for other needs, for the glory of God. And so at the start, God may test our obedience by letting us go alone. Are you, are you willing to bear the burden? Are you willing to, to, to bear the weight? But if we'll obey him in the lonely moment, He'll send a support group along the way if we're trusting the hand of God. And again, it may not look like the team that you would assemble, but it'll be the team that he gives you, that he says is enough for your journey. So not only, not only 
does Ezra seek the willing and ask for help? But, but number two, the second thing I want to point out to you is he's specific in praying. Look at verse 21. I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before God to seek from him safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. What's he praying for? Humility, right? That we might humble ourselves. Humility and safety. And so he declares a fast. He says, look, all right, we, we, God's providing for our needs here. Sent the kinsmen, sent the team. God's providing for our needs. Okay, before we go, we got to stop and pray. And he takes it a step further, to fast. Now, there's, there's some misconception on fasting. So can, can we just take a, 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 slight, a slight detour and talk about fasting for just a second, okay? So a lot of people say that fasting is food. True. Fasting can also be TV. Fasting can also be music. Fasting can also be spending money. Fasting can, fasting can be depriving yourself of anything that stands in between you and God at any time for the focus, for the purpose of spending the time that you would be spending on that, seeking the will of God for your life. Make sense? And so for many of us, and y'all know me, food is my spiritual gift, Okay, for many of us, food is that most dominating thing, right? That most dominating thing, okay? It's really sad when you're sitting at one meal already planning your next meal, right? But there's some strategy that goes into that, right? Because I know if I'm, if I'm eating a certain thing at dinner, then I want to plan for that at lunch because I don't want to be too full at dinner to enjoy the thing at dinner because I ruined it with my lunch. You see what I'm saying, right? I mean, there's some strategy that goes into that right? But fasting is depriving ourselves of anything that would stand in between us and God, right? It's depriving ourselves. Of any, so, so, you know, fasting secular music, fasting movies, fasting TV, fasting uh, uh, sweets, fasting coffee, as long as loved ones aren't near for like Five to seven days, okay? I told Kristen before she went on this trip, because she's gone for 10 days, I was like, I might try to go off of caffeinated coffee while you're away. Her response, oh, the poor kids. <laughs> so I haven't done that. <laughs> We're still high tests. I'll wait and do that. Never. Um, right? And so, and so he's specific here in praying, though. And he's praying for God's protection. He's praying that his heart would rely on God. And then look at verse 23. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. He implored God for this, right? He restricted self-solutions. And so if we want to call on God, right, we've got to ask for help. We've got to seek, we've got to seek his willing heart to provide for us. We've got to be specific in our asks, and we've got to, we've, we've got to restrict the urge, right? We've got to restrict the urge to say, oh, I've got a solution for this. Right? Because while it might be a good idea, it might not be God's idea. We've got to restrict self-solutions. We must pray from a need for God and not a courtesy. See, that, that's where I think many of us go wrong in our prayer lives. Is we're just praying because we think it's the right thing to do. Courtesy. Right? Okay, God, I'll include you in that. I, I have a pretty strong feeling. I already know which way I'm going to go. I got a pretty strong feeling, so I'm pretty closed off here, God, for you rocking the boat or asking me to do something different. I'm pretty closed off here. I pretty much already know what I'm going to do, right? Um, but but I'll, I'll, I'll ask just so you feel part of the team, right? You ever do that? You ever do that? You know where you're going to eat lunch today, but you might ask the car just to see, right, and then squash all hopes and dreams, Right? No, no, I decided yesterday where we're, you know, like, but you might, you might want them to feel part of the team, right? Right. We must pray from a need for God. Because isn't that the whole point of praying? Is to remind yourself of who's really in charge. 
to remind yourself of who's really got the keys to this thing. And one of the most powerful stories I've ever heard on prayer. A uh, guy by the name of Francis Chan used to pastor a church in Simi Valley, California. Small church, about 3,000 people. Had a staff of like, I don't know, 90 or 100 people. And he's in staff meeting one day, which put that in perspective, a little less than what's in here. And he, and he looked at his staff and he said, and he said um, I need to know if you're not praying every day. Because we need to talk about your job here. Because if you're not praying every day, then who are you relying on for what you're doing here? This story in Ezra 8 is really a story about prayer. It's, it's a story of, of Ezra's desperate need for God. That two times he, he mentions that he declared a fast before they left because they desperately needed God for his provision, for his safety, and they needed to remember who was in control. To humble themselves and remember who was in control. And so they did nothing until they prayed and fasted. They didn't move until the fast was over. And so what does that mean? Look at verses 24 through 30. Then I set apart 12 of the leading priests. Okay? 12 of the leading priests. Verse 25. And I'm just going to skip the names, okay? And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offering for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I weighed out into their hands 650 talents of silver, and silver vessels worth 200 talents, and 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth 100 derricks, and two vessels of fine bronze, fine bright bronze, excuse me, as precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord, and the vessels are holy, and the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord. God had provided for their needs the God of our fa- your fathers. Verse 29, guard them and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel at Jerusalem within the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites took over the weight of the silver and the gold, and the vessels, to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of our God. So we see three things here. Number one, we see preparation. Right? We see preparation. Ezra prepared. He, he took all of it. He weighed it. He gave them the man, right? He gave them the expectation, protect these, guard these with your life until you get there, until they're weighed out. He prepared. Look at the packing and the purpose, right, there, that, 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 that he did this with, right? He prepared. Have you ever heard the story of the two farmers? Okay, Dylan has because he spoiled it this morning for the worship team, okay? Two farmers, both of them prayed for rain. One of them went out and prepared the fields for rain. The other one sat in his house and waited for rain. Which one do you think was ready for the Lord's blessing? The one that went out and prepared his fields. The one that went out and prepared his fields. Right? And so as we're praying, we got to prepare our hearts for God's outpouring of blessing. Right? We got to prepare our hearts. We got to prepare for what God's going to do here. And so the preparation process. Then then we see, look at verse 31. Then we departed. So now they're going, right? They prayed, they fasted, they've made preparations, they got everything together, they packed up. Then we departed. And that's always a good feeling, isn't it? It's always a good feeling. You've made preparations for the trip. You've packed the car, right? Which if you're anything like me, that's, that's the biggest step. 
right? That's the biggest step. Once you're in the car, right, and then you back out of the driveway, you're on. Then they departed from the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. Look at this specific here. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes, by the way. They departed. The vision was enabled. And then lastly, look at verse 32. He says, we came to Jerusalem. We came to Jerusalem, and there we remained three days. And on the fourth day, within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Merimoth, the priest, the son of Uriah. And with him was El- Eleazar, the son of Phinehas. And with him were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of B- Benui. The whole offering, the whole was counted and weighed, and the weight of everything was recorded. The weight of everything was recorded. The realization that God had been with them the whole way. And so let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. What are you asking God for? What are you asking God for? Where do you recognize that God, if you don't show up, this thing's not happening. This thing's not happening. What are you asking God for? Where are you recognizing your need for God? What do the scriptures say in the New Testament? Ask, and the door will be open. Seek, and you will find. Or ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock. And the door will be open. And so just very simply today, I want to, I want to go on a scale of one to five. And I'm not asking you to share this with anybody. If you want to write it on your connection card and say, Pastor, this is my number. Will you pray for me that I recognize my need for God? You can drop it in the offering bucket. Somebody will make sure that gets to me. I'll be praying for you. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to tell me your number. I'm not. But on a scale of one to five, How's your prayer life? Because that is how we demonstrate to God our need for Him. We can come to church every Sunday. We can be a part of a small group and not share and not open up. We can, we can, we can serve. We can serve. We can do all of these things and never, ever recognize our need for God. Never ever ask God to change our circumstances. Never ask God for help along the way. Never go to the corner and say, hey, I need the spit bucket. Hey, I, I need a minute. Hey, can, can we take a time out here? Can, 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 you, can, you guys, can you guys press right here because I just got knocked pretty good and this thing's about to close up and I'm not going to be able to see out of this eye. Can you guys support me for a minute? And why do we do that? Because we don't want to believe that we're needy. We don't want to believe that we're broken. We don't want to believe that we need others to help us. Listen to me, family. The longer I'm a Christian, the longer I'm in ministry, the longer I'm a husband, the longer I'm a parent, the longer I try to have friendships, the more I recognize how needy I am. There is not one of you in here. I know this. There's not one of you in here that's not broken. I know, because I used to be broken. No, I'm just kidding. I know because it takes one to know one. There is a place in every single one of our lives where we desperately need God. And so can I encourage you, friend, family, today, press in to Him. Press in to Him. Just pray. Just pray. Jesus says 
in Matthew, pray like this. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? And that's a model prayer. But if, you, if you're sitting here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I don't even know how to start. Let me tell you something. Go home. Get in a quiet place. Grab a journal. Because I love writing out my prayers. And start at the top. Dear God. Dear God. And tell him what you're thankful for. Tell him how badly you need him and ask him for his help in your life. And list those things out. I say in base camp, which is where we teach people um, kind of the basics of Christianity, how to study your Bible, how to pray, all that. I'm going to finish with this. I say in base camp, when you don't know how to pray, just pray. Just start talking to God like you would talk to the person sitting next to you. Just start talking to God like you're talking to the person sitting next to you. I love the quote. You've probably heard me say it before. My favorite quote on prayer is this. I never pray for more than five minutes, but I never go five minutes without praying. I love that. I never pray for more than five minutes, but I never go five minutes without praying. Now, that's not me, because I already told you, every day I love to sit down and write out my prayers. And that's a rhythm for me. That's something I love to do that's, that's natural for me. But you know, you know my favorite place to pray? I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. My favorite place to pray is Hannaford. I love it. Hannaford. Because as I'm walking up and down the aisle, if you see me in Hannaford, no, I'm praying for you. If I see you in Hannaford, I'm praying for you. As I'm, I'm praying for people. As I pass them in Hannaford, walking up and down, I, I just love it. I got the shopping cart. When I go grocery shopping, I, I'm looking for things everywhere because I don't know the grocery store like most of you guys know the grocery store. So it takes me about five or six laps around the grocery store to find everything that I'm there to get. And so I just take a nice, easy pace around the grocery store. I typically see people two, three, sometimes four times as I'm passing them by in my six rounds around the grocery store. And I just whisper, God, whatever they're going through today, I pray that you'd be with them. God, if that person doesn't know you today, I pray that you would use somebody to point them to your son Jesus. God, whatever they're going through today, I pray that you would soften the blow. Unless you need to just deck them, God, and deck them however you want to, but pick them back up at some point. I never never pray for more than five minutes, but I never go five minutes without praying. How's your prayer life? What are you asking God for? Have you recognized your desperate need for him lately? And so God, as I stand here this morning, we need you. As I stand here this morning, I know that my family needs you. As I stand here this morning, I know that these families need you. As I stand here this morning, I know that every individual watching this online, sitting in this room, standing here with a microphone on, we need you. And God, as I'm standing here this morning, I know Summit Church needs you. And so God, I pray this morning that as Ezra prayed in his situation, God, that we would recognize our need for you in humility. And that, God, we would unashamedly ask for you to meet our needs. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. God, you promised throughout Scripture to hear us, which is unbelievable. What grace. Such grace. But not only hear us, but to answer our prayers and to give us everything we need. Not want, but need. And so God, I thank you that you're going to meet our needs as a church. I thank you that you're going to meet our needs as a body of individuals. I thank you that you're going to meet our needs 
as the families represented here. God, there may be somebody sitting here saying, I don't know how we're going to eat this week. I don't know how we're going to pay rent this month or the rest of the year. I don't know how we're going to, I don't know how we're going to, I don't know how we're going to do this or that or that. God, I thank you that you're a God that hears us when we pray and loves to care for us in meeting our needs. And so God, I pray that each one of us in the room would evaluate how we're leaning on you in our prayer lives. And that God, today, we would commit to looking to you first instead of last. To looking you, to you out of need over courtesy. In Jesus' name I pray.